there was one thing I promised you a little bit in the email exchange that we were going to go through the Army of Potomac's commanders um, because you, I found it really interesting reading through your book because um, I kind of, based on the way I was taught that there were certain commanders that just didn't work well in that position and you kind of helped correct some of those thoughts and that was sort of interesting. I thought that we can just go through like the individual commanders of the Army of the Potomac and I'll throw you one curveball at the end. Okay. <laughs> and kind of based on what you discovered with in the writing of the book, kind of what, how would you evaluate these individuals and kind of how, how does what you discovered correct our assumptions about them? Kind of, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, first I'll say that, you know, there's a reason I didn't play baseball past high school. It's because I couldn't hit the curveball. I promise it's not going to be a difficult one. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope not because I have trouble with this. Um, yeah, well, let, me, let, me, let me start out with an umbrella statement and then I'll work my way through those guys fairly quickly. Okay. I think the umbrella statement is that I end up reevaluating Abraham Lincoln mm -hmm. in ways that I did not expect, although previous research made, I think, pointed in that direction. You know, I, I like Lincoln. I think he's our greatest president. I have his, I have a Lincoln poster in my office door. I think strategically he was a really smart guy on top of other things. But I'm not convinced he ever really grasped the tactical and operational needs of an army in terms of logistics or transport or supply or just movement. Mm -hmm. uh, he's hard on his generals. He expects them to be, be able to do things that they often cannot do because of the realities of bad weather and other realities. In that sense, there are times when he's just the worst kind of armchair general. Why couldn't you move 20 miles that way? Well, because we were encased in mud. So that's going to affect all the commanders of the Army of the Potomac. McDowell is, is not in command that long. Um, and we know that McDowell tries to convince the president that his army is not ready to march. When he is sent out to march, he wants to do it fairly quickly because Julys get really hot in Virginia and he wants to move before the hottest weather sets in. And because of all sorts of delays with food and transportation and political delays and everything else, that doesn't happen. So when the army marches to Manassas, these raw rookie troops are marching through the hottest part of the Virginia summer, which is why they are exhausted and dehydrated okay. by the time they get to the battlefield. And that certainly affects their performance, I think. Um, I think McDowell was right to worry about whether his army was up to that. Um, and the reason the Confederates can't pursue, by the way, is that they're dealing with the same things. McClellan I write about a lot. Um, I grew up with that mindset that I think everybody else grows up with, that he was kind of, he was timid, he was hesitant, he was argumentative, he was power hungry. You know, I mean, these are things I actually saw on the internet yesterday. Uh, and I, I came out of this project with a better opinion of McClellan. It doesn't mean that I think he was a genius or he should have stayed in command even, but McClellan was a veteran soldier and he'd also been an engineer and he had run a railroad company and a realistic idea of what it took to move and feed and supply a lot of men. Mm -hmm. And I think he does a pretty good job of that, but he's constantly being sniped at by Washington. That first winter of the war, all quite along the Potomac, why isn't McClellan doing something? There are literally periods when his army is stuck in the mud that winter, that, that weird, possibly El Nino winter. And so he really can't do much. Why doesn't he pursue Joe Johnston when Johnston retreats across the Rappahannock? Well, he does to an extent, but again, bad weather, mud, makes it very difficult. Okay. Weather coming up the peninsula, it rains pretty much on average every other day. Um, so it's constantly wet, that, that sandy red clay of the peninsula is constantly wet and, and bottomless. And in a way, it's remarkable that he actually does get the army up to Richmond when he does. Uh, he makes a lot of mistakes on the peninsula, including you know, not knowing where the Warwick River was. But he has men fighting under him in 1862 who will be with Grant two years later. 
and they will say, yeah, Grant's so great, except it's taken Grant longer to get to Richmond than it took us under McClellan, and the weather's better. So the conditions are actually better. Look at what McClellan did. Why aren't we having that conversation? Um, I don't think, well, there are a few battles that have better conditions for killing people than Antietam, but it certainly turns chilly after that. Um, McClellan, he kind of gets a raw deal, I think. Uh, again, just yesterday on the internet, some, a group of people that I don't know, it was on a site I visit sometimes, were, were laughing about how Lincoln had told McClellan after, after Antietam, why are your horses tired? What on earth have they done to be tired? Well, they had done a lot that summer. Mm -hmm. And they had traveled a long way. And the notion that McClellan was just a slacker who was hiding from Lee, I think is inaccurate. He loses his job. Ambrose Burnside is just unlucky. I, I'm, I mean, it's just never go to a horse race with Ambrose Burnside because <laughs> the man is just unlucky. We can talk about the terrible weather before Fredericksburg, which in part helped to lay those pontoons. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't do a particularly good job managing the Battle of Fredericksburg, but the mud march is, is not all his fault. Burnside knows he has to, first of all, Burnside knows he has to launch a winter campaign, which in, which in itself is questionable. Um, I was actually thinking just this morning, you know, the, the Union cause might have been better off if Lincoln had just said, go ahead and go into winter camps this winter. Mm -hmm. Because Fredericksburg had such a terrible effect on northern morale, northern recruiting, leads mm -hmm. to conscription, leads to copperheads. But then you've got the mud march. Burnside wants to go across the river at a different point, and he wants to do it at a certain moment that Lincoln is listening to all of his critics and won't let Burnside move, so they waste really good weather. Mm -hmm. And then when Burnside finally gets permission to move, he can't go to where he originally planned to go because it's been in the newspapers and Lee knows. So he finds a different place to cross and he gets hit by a massive nor'easter the first day. I mean, the man is just unlucky. That's not to say he's a skilled commander. I don't think he is. But in terms of weather, he just, he's terribly unlucky. Joe Hooker, Joe Hooker, we often read about how Hooker built the morale of that army after Fredericksburg and after the Mother March. You know, he built the finest army on the planet. You know, I think we could say even more about that because usually when we talk about what Hooker was up against, uh, we forget how horrible that winter was mm. and how bad the roads were and how hard it was to get supplies. And, and it was really a rather Herculean effort to, to rebuild that army in those conditions. Um, he also wants to attack early in, well, late April actually, and then the weather turns bad and he has to wait until May, then Chancellor's Law happens. Yeah, I think Hooker does a, a really remarkable job of rebuilding the army. And we, we, all, we all know that, it's in our textbooks, but the job was actually bigger than we understand because that was such a bad winter and roads were terrible. So getting those new uniforms in or getting food in or getting all the things that he, he provides to that army uh, was more difficult than I think we imagined. Mm -hmm. um, after that, after Chancellorsville, and let's not forget on the last night of Chancellorsville, he's cut off from his own army by a massive rainstorm and a flooded river. Uh, he pursues Lee. He pursues Lee through a very hot period. He loses lots of men along the way. Uh, he's actually in a hotter area than Lee is, west of the mountains. So uh, summer heat has even a more devastating effect on the Army of Potomac. Meade takes over. Um, I, I end up defending Meade more than I ever thought I would in my life. I think it would have been very difficult for him to have stopped Lee north of the Potomac. He makes decisions at the moment that make perfect sense, and then he is just frustrated by roughly two weeks of incredibly rainy weather. Lee immediately goes west through those mountain passes and then south down to the Potomac, south down to Falling Waters. And it's a hellish experience for anybody on the march. Meade makes the decision to rest his army for a bit and then move straight south down the turnpike and cross the mountains in Maryland. The problem is when all that rain comes, and Meade starts to move south, finally starts to move south after a couple of his generals have, 
held him up to with, with bad information. Uh, they make a lot of progress that first day on the turnpike, but traffic jams inevitably happen. Um, wagoneers and artillery pieces and all, men start going off the road and they start getting stuck because while we think about red clay as being particularly southern, and it is, if you look at a map of the red clay belt, there's a little finger of red clay that pokes out of Virginia through Maryland and runs smack dab into Little Round Top. <laughs> Literally. I mean, I spoke in Gettysburg and, and talked about this, and for the next month, friends and people that I met in Gettysburg, like uh, Daryl Black and Pete Neal at the Seminary Ridge Museum, were out driving around trying to delineate the red clay belt along the Gettysburg <laughs> battlefield. Me go south on that turnpike, the guys go off the road because they want to get around the, the wagon that's stuck or broken down, and they go right into that, that, that yeah. red car. They make 20 miles that day in some cases, but they're so worn out that you end up with two core who can't cross the mountains with their horses because they've worn them out on the way south. And when they get down there, of course, as, as Eric Wittenberg and, and David Petruzzi point out, you know, Lee has constructed fortifications that, that rival Fredericksburg's. Yeah. And then there's a moment where the river drops because it has stopped raining. The river drops and it starts rising. And it's that moment that Lee's able to get across. After that, the president really doesn't forgive Meade and keeps him on a short leash. And so you get examples like the Mine Run campaign, mm -hmm. where the last thing he'd wanted to do was go through the wilderness and hit Lee at Mine Run. But he stole it for political reasons. He can't take the army back to Fredericksburg. Right. So I think all of these generals, I don't know what your curveball is, but I think all of these generals had a better operational sense of what it took to move men in often difficult weather but their operational sense did not meet the strategic needs of the Lincoln administration. And they got in trouble for it. And I think Lincoln in some ways was harder on them than he should have been. I mean, finally he met a kindred spirit in U.S. Grant. Mm -hmm. He was just as willing to disregard weather as, as, as he was. And that changes the war too. Well, the curveball is General Rosecrans. I love talking about William Rosecrans. I was more than happy to talk about Rosecrans. So, I, mean, I figured you had a lot to say about him. That's a hanging curveball. I, even I can probably hit that one. <laughs> if we're going to talk about Rosecrans, though, we have to go back a little bit for a second to Don Carlos Buell. The same situation operates in the West as in the East. Uh, the White House perhaps is even more impatient with generals who won't move where seemingly they're supposed to move because they're complaining about weather or the lack of forage or, you know, there's nothing for my men to eat there. So Buell goes through this. I mean, twice in 1862, he refuses to take his army into East Tennessee because he says, I can't feed my men and horses there. Eventually gets fired up to bury the... Rosecrans takes over. Rosecrans has a distinguished career up to that point. I mean, he's, he's fought in West Virginia at Rich Mountain through a driving rainstorm, by the way, crawling up a mountain, which is, if you've ever been to Rich Mountain, it's an incredible feat, what those Federals did there. Uh, he's fought in the West, I mean, you know, this, he fights at Iuka, where his army, Stormy Price's army, runs into each other, again, because it had recently rained and there's no dust and they don't know the other armies coming. But he takes command of the Army of the Cumberland before Stones River. He fights there in some terribly bad conditions of rain and cold. He wins that battle, and he is determined that he's not going to move against Bragg until he has enough supplies. So he spends months building up Fortress Rosecrans outside of Murfreesboro, okay. which drives the president, Henry Halleck, up the wall. But again, he's like, like Buell, he's saying, if I'm going into East Tennessee, I've got to make sure I've built up enough supplies to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. Finally, in the summer, he moves against Bragg at Tullahoma in what Maybe it depends on who you ask, what may be at least the middle Tennessee storm of the, of the century. Um, one author argues it's the worst storm in 10,000 years, but as a 
very skilled meteorologist pointed out to me, we don't have records going back that far, so there's no way to know that. <laughs> but it's really, really bad. And nonetheless, he, he pushes Bragg's army out of Middle Tennessee to Chattanooga, which is an incredible feat. And he gets no credit for it whatsoever uh -huh. because, you know, there's no Battle of Gettysburg, there's no Battle of Vicksburg, so big deal. He makes a critical mistake at Chickamauga, and it's a big mistake. He makes a critical mistake, falls back into the sea, uh, eventually loses his command. I, you know, would I have left Rosecrans in command in Chattanooga at that point? Probably not after that defeat, but I think he deserves more credit than he gets. Um, I'm so glad that, uh, that, um, Dave Powell and Eric Wittenberg have, have done their new book on Tullahoma, which I haven't had a chance to read yet, but I want to. It's the forgotten campaign of the war. And at every level, tactically, strategically, operationally, it's a brilliant campaign. I mean, he retakes Middle Tennessee with the loss of a few hundred men uh, through weather conditions that no other Civil War general had to face except Braxton Burdett, who did much more poorly. Um, yeah, I, I give the man credit for what he accomplished.